So today we are going to concentrate on the third and the fourth Salah and Zakah. Uh, please let us go to the first slide. But I hope that some of you who attended the sessions on the Jamaat Khana uh, during the talk which I gave about um, the evolution of the practices and places of worship, I had used this slide. So this slide is a repetition. And the reason why I am bringing it here is to reinforce that there are five pillars in Islam and there are seven pillars in Islam, but there are also exoteric interpretations and there are esoteric interpretations. So for instance, uh, we have said yesterday that uh, the five pillars, there are four of them which are common to the uh, Shias as well. But amongst the Shias, it's not just Ismailis, there are Ithana Asharis, there are Musa Alawiyan, and many other groups as well. So we have to be very clear what our understanding of this knowledge is. So I want you to bear in mind that Sirat e Mustaqim or Sirat al Mustaqim is a straight path. It is the shortest path between us and our ultimate goal, which is the Noor. It's a straight path. But no person who understands logic will ever say that such a path from its beginning to its goal has to be the same, 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 same. It can't be. You know, even in a, a physical journey, say from in uh, U United Kingdom, from London to um, uh, Edinburgh, or if you take America from Dallas to California, you know, you will pass through many different scenes. Uh, you may have to climb sometimes and you might have to uh, go through deserts and forests, etc., etc. No path can logically be expected to be exactly the same from its uh, beginning to its end. That's logic, absolute logic. Nobody can refute that. So what we are saying is that Sirat al mustaqim the straight path, the right path in Islam also has stages. And these are four stages of Shariat, Tariqat, Hakikat, and Marifat. So the journey starts with Shariat, continues to Tariqat, reaches Hakikat, and then only can you go to Marifat, and at the end of the level of Marifat, you can merge in the Noor. Please remember that. Please connect what I'm saying now to what I have said previously, because this is the beauty of Hakikati knowledge, that it should be incremental. It should give you different, different dimensions of understanding. So let's go to the second slide now. Okay. I decided last night that I would like to bring in this point. And this is a very interesting point, And some of you may find it difficult to understand. But I believe that some of you have been listening to Zahir Lalani talking about cyclical uh, times in Ismaili understanding, cycles. So perhaps if you have attended those lectures, you may well understand uh, this uh, quite easily. This is a quotation from Sayyidina Nasiruddin Tusi. He also was at the time of Alamor. And he is a brilliant man from all accounts uh, because he was a mathematician, a logician. Uh, he was an astronomer. Uh, he has written a complete book on ethics, a, a brilliant scholar. But he was not born in an Ismaili fam family. And I will talk about that a bit later. So first, let's just concentrate on this, which is a complicated uh, uh, piece of uh, uh, knowledge. He says, with respect to the proximity of the advent of the resurrection, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said, I hope that God Almighty will not leave me in my grave more than half a day. 
So first and foremost, this is a hadith, and the prophet is talking about God not leaving him in his uh, physical grave for more than half a day. Obviously, the words itself say to you and to me that this hadith also needs ta'wil. It needs an inner meaning. Otherwise, you cannot understand it. So, and the people at that time also, when he pronounced his words, they asked him how long this half day would be. He replied, 500 years. Because the Quran says, verily, one year of your Lord is like 1,000 years of your reckoning, which is in Surah 22, Ayat 46. Which means that the mission of the resurrection will be proclaimed 500 years after his time. And I've given you the reference there. This is Paradise of Submission, which was edited and translated by Sayyid Jalal Badakhshani. It has been published by the Institute. And this quotation is from page 157. And it is a, not an easy book to read, but it's a very essential book to read. Very, very essential. So I would like to explain a little bit more about, uh, to link it with Zahir's uh, presentation last night, that according to the ta'wil of the Qur'an as presented by Ismailis, and it is the Ismailis who emphasize the ta'wil of the Qur'an, uh, which is why we have, throughout history, we have been known as the Batiniyun. Batiniyun, we believe in the bat batin of the Qur'an because the Holy Prophet had pronounced that every zahir of the Qur'an has a batin, in fact, seven batins. And on another occasion, he had said, 70 bathings. And we know from our history that Maulana Jafar Sadiq had once um, said to a murid who had come to him one week with an ayah, the Imam gave him one tawil, he came back the next week with the same ayah, and the Imam gave him a different tawil. And this Mormon was totally bewildered. And he said, But Mola, last week you gave me something different. This week you are giving me something different. So Molana Jafar Sadiq said that if you come to me again and again, I can give you 70 batins. In fact, if you want more, more than that. So this is a very important point for us Ismailis. Ta'wil is a dynamic thing because it is linked to the succession to the, of the rightful imam to the throne of imamat. Every succeeding imam gives ta'wil according to his time and space, which is what makes the Ismaili community a dynamic community, which is, you know, I explained quite a lot yesterday in my uh, quotation from Maulana Sultan Muhammad Shah about the importance of Ulul Amra. And why is it important to obey Ulul Amra immediately after that to the Prophet and God? So we should remember that. And now this one year of a human being, the Quran says, um, uh, sorry, one year of Allah for our human reckoning is a thousand years. So the ta'wil of the six days of creation in the Quran is, is not about the physical creation. If it was about the physical creation, then all these atheists and agnostic scientists would laugh at you which they are laughing at, those who stick to the Zahir. And they say, look, how can you say that the world was created 6,000 years ago? And they laugh, actually laugh, and they write lots of critical books about that. So it is not about the physical creation. It is about the creation of the world of religion. And how is the world of cre uh, religion created? In a 7,000-year a cycle, which lasts from Hazrat Adam to the time of Hazrat Ka'im, 7,000 years each time. And this 1,000 years, if you divide that into half, half a day will mean 500 years. And 500 years means that if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, our history, that uh, Molana Hassan Allah Zikri Salam 
declared the Eid al Qiyama on the 19th of Ramadan, 559 after Hijrah. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I, I got that wrong. 19th of Ramadan in the year 1164 of AD. Maybe I get that right? 1164, no, 1164 will be Hijra, yeah, after Hijra. So what have we got here? That if you take away 632, the year of the Prophet's passing from 1164, you get 532 remaining. And this 532, because Islamic uh, uh, years are shorter by 11 days from the uh, others, uh, the, uh, the Gregorian calendar, the Christian calendar, we, then that comes to about 515 years. I tried to do the arithmetic. I'm not very good at it, but uh, approximately 500 years. And that's exactly what this hadith says, that 500 years approximately after the prophet, the holy prophet uh, um, passed from this physical world, that the kiamat would happen. And this is what did happen in Alamot. And it was declared by Mawlana Hassan Allah Zikri His Salam, because in 500 years, the Ismailis, the Murids of the Imam, had uh, uh, absolutely followed the Sharia. They, uh, the Imams were very strict about it. I'll talk about that as well earlier. So I'm not going to repeat myself. And they, we had become strong in understanding the meanings of Sharia. So then the Imam, by his mercy and grace, he promoted us to Qiyamati Talim. Qiyamati Talim from Sharia to Qiyamati Talim. And the Qiyamati Talim, you will see in the next slide, uh, is very challenging. So let's go to the next slide. Here we are. So here we are, we have the Tanzil or the time of Sharia or Tawil or the time of Qiyama, right? I, I, I really want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. I used this also in my earlier presentation on Jamaat Khana. And I want to show how on the level of Sharia, uh, because it is initial uh, teachings, because it is a period immediately after the Prophet, his time and after him 500 years, that during that uh, time, it was uh, compulsory for people to, re uh, to uh, recite namaz five times a day. Namaz or salat, yes? Now, if a Muslim brother from another interpretation asks us, do you pray five times a day? I'm going to stop, yes? And because I want you all to think of what answer is would you give in your mind? Don't say it aloud. There's no time for that because there are 150 people on this line. I just want you to think about it. If a Muslim brother from another interpretation asks you, do you pray five times a day? What will be your answer? I know many Ismailis who have given the wrong answer. They have said no. We don't pray five times a day, we pray three times a day. I've actually even seen an Ismaili scholar, uh, I've heard an Ismaili scholar say that on a video. This is completely incorrect information about us, completely incorrect. Because five times a, a, a namaz is not to be contrasted with three times dua. Three times dua is something which came into our tariqah much later, in the time of Pir Sadruddin in Molana Islam Shah's time, when he established Jamaat Khanas in Hind and Sindh. Five, three times dua is actually only for congregational purposes, where Jamaat get together 
And apart from prayers and rites and ceremonies, they also do other things like voluntary service and social welfare and education and everything else. The correct answer would be say, would be to say we remember Allah all the time. That is the difference between charity teaching and kiamati teaching or between tanzili talimat and ta'wili talimat and you have to substantiate it from the quran we are going to look at those ayats in a few minutes uh, surah 3 ayat 191 and 723 so the contrast is not between five and three <laughs> because if that was a, the case then ismailis would lose every time when they would lose the argument. And I want to give you an example that this has happened. And this example is from a very high authority in our Jamaat. This example is that an intellectual Ismaili was asked by a Muslim friend, do you, my brother, pray five times a day? That Ismaili was very intellectual, sharp, logical he had thought about his faith and he answered he said my muslim brother why do you want to confine me in remembering allah only five times a day this is called the taidi answer this is what is called the taidi answer because he without getting into any debate or useless argument about numbers, he simply said, I remember God all the time. Then, so this is about Salah, which is a common uh, pillar between the five and the seven. The next pillar which is common is Zakat. So on the level of Tanzil or Sharia, you are only obligated to give two and a half percent if you have any savings at the end of the year. But on the level of the will or kiamati talim, you have to give twelve and a half percent of your earnings. You don't have to wait until the end of the year. Every time you earn, you give after tax. 12 and a half percent of your earnings. That's why Walana Sultan Muhammad Shah says in his uh, memoirs, give unto Caesar, i.e. the government, what is their due, and then give unto God what is his due. Look at how different the Tanzil or Shariati Talim is and how how challenging the Tawil or Kiamati Talim is. All right, then this one, the third one here, which is about uh, Rosa, or fasting, or Son, these are all synonyms, which we are going to do next weekend. 30 days of fasting from food and water, from sunrise to sunset. But in the time of the will, or Kiamati teaching, fasting throughout the year from unethical acts. You are forbidden to do anything unethical with your eyes, with your ears, with your uh, lips, your uh, tongue, your feelings, your thoughts. You are allowed, not allowed to do anything unethical for the entire year, for the <laughs> entire time you are on this planet. It's a very big difference. And then Hajj, which is also common with them. Hajj means, you know, if you are able to, you have enough money, you have looked after your family, you are not ill, you can go and do Hajj once in your lifetime by visiting the house of God in uh, Makkah. We are going to do that next weekend as well. But look at the difference between the Tanzili teachings. Just go and visit the physical house of God. And many people have been, millions and millions have been. And ask anybody, have you, did you actually have the Didar of God when you went to the uh, house in uh, Makkah? But here in the Tawili or the Kiamati teachings, 
it is to see the living spiritual house of Allah. And who is the living spiritual house of Allah? Who contains the light of Allah in its perfect form? The Imam of the time from the direct descent of Hazrat Nabi Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. I want you to be very clear, please. Um, in my years of being al Waisa, I have found that Jamaat is trying to mix Sharia with Qiyama because they don't have any information about our history. They don't know that Ismaili Tarika has one principle follow the Imam of the time. And that may be different from the previous Imam. So Mawlana Hassan Allah Zikri Salam declared Qiyama in the month of Ramadan. He told the Jamaat, I know you're fasting from food and water, break your fast. And he taught them these things. Remember Allah all the time. The son, the car, 12 and a half percent from earnings, not savings. Fasting from unethical acts throughout the year, throughout your life. And to have the didar of the Imam of the time, you know, this is why in the Ginans, our priests say is that the Imam's didar is very difficult. Do hello. This is the true, true didar, not, you know, sitting there and thinking of something else. A true Dida, understanding who it is who is sitting there on the stage. That would be the true Dida. We will come to that when we also do Hajj, etc. So let's go on to the next one. So this is again Sayyidina Nasir bin Tusi, and again it is from the Paradise of Submission, and it is about Salah. So now you see, he comes, uh, uh, he became an Ismaili after reading the uh, uh, lectures or sermons of Mawlana Hassan al-Zikri Salam uh, called Fusul al-Muqadda. He, uh, he read those sermons. He was not born in any Ismaili family. I've already told you that he was absolutely brilliant in secular knowledge. And when he, he read those sacred chapters, as they are called in English, he said, I occupied myself day and night at reading it. To the extent of my humble understanding and ability, I gained endless benefits from those sacred words, which are the light of hearts and the illuminator of inner thoughts. My inner sight was unveiled. Yes. And then he also says, that after that, he simply wanted to be an Ismaili, belong to the Ismaili Jamaat. And therefore, he did apply, uh, he uh, learned about Ismailism and he became an Ismaili. There's another quotation of his, in which he says, Now that I have come to know that unique person who is the man of the epoch, the Imam of the age, the teacher of the followers of Ta'alim, the locus of the word, he who enables one to recognize God, praise be to him. And now that I have surrendered to the fact that he is the real instructor, the truthful one, the ruler, I have attained the status of submission, utterly abandoned my own will and arrived at the realm of learning and subjection beautiful words of total submission to the Imam. And where did I get these words from? They are, these words are actually from a book by Sayyidina Nasiruddin Tusi called Sayyir Wa uh, In English it has been translated uh, uh, not too appropriately as Contemplation and Action and it is published by the Institute but if you don't, uh, uh, you don't have to go to that book. You can go to the secondary education uh, program of our uh, Jamaat, which has been produced also by the 
um, education department at the IIS, go to a, a book which is called Muslim Devotion and Devotional and Ethical Literature. This quotation is on page 96. And the quotation which I have just read, okay? This one, which is on the screen, is from Paradise of Submission as well. And I want you to read this very carefully. And uh, uh, Dr. Hunstai uh, helped me to make sure that we also transliterate the Farsi so that nobody can challenge us about what, the, uh, what Sayyidina Tusi is saying here. Let's read it together. Comparing the difference between the two periods of Tanzil or Sharia and Ta'wil or Qiyamat, Nasiruddin Tusi says that in the former period, i.e. Sharia, obedience is performed within the confines of set timings. It is confined, limited to certain times. And worship is, is fixed, uh, sorry, worship is immersed in fixed timings, right? So you will see that in a minute when I talk about the Zahir of the Salah, we have all the names of the namaz there. So he's saying worship is immersed in fixed timings. My Muslim friend, why do you want to limit me to remembering God five times a day? That was the answer of the intellectual smiley. Whereas in the latter time, that is the Kiamat, obedience is performed with the removal of the fixed timing. And the entire time is immersed in a state of obedience. Entire time. The, an Ismaili cannot say, I am an Ismaili when I'm in Jamaat Khana, and then when I go to my business and uh, my college or wherever else, uh, that I'm not an Ismaili. Why does the Imam say, Live your faith, live your faith? Your life should itself be an expression of your faith, of your tariqa, of your bayya to the Imam of the time. Why does he say, remember him all the time? Now, you see, if you have this, uh, I, I made a slide of this because I want you to have this uh, uh, paragraph. I want you to have this quotation to read every time to understand why the Ismaili Tariqa's interpretation is different. And it is different. We have to, you know, have confidence and say, yes, it is different. We do not believe in remembering God at certain times only. We believe that all our time is immersed in ibadah, in remembrance of God. Let's go to the next one. So now we've come to Salah, and I've got you all the names here so that you know. Um, I've done this because yesterday somebody even asked a question like, what is Ruku? So obviously there are members of our Jamaat who are unaware of the, uh, the terminology in Sharia. We should be aware of it, you know, because it is also our first 500 year history that we also practice these things. So the reason I have uh, though set it out like this is because there's another popular question in the Jamaat. The Jamaat thinks that uh, there are no, uh, that five time namaz is not mentioned in the Quran. Well, look at this. Salat of dawn and night is mentioned in Surah 1778. Salat of two ends of the day in uh, Surah 11, 114. And Salat of the middle of the day in Surah 238. Yes, it is not one ayat. Because the namazes were not all revealed at one time. <laughs> the first namaz to be, released, uh, uh, to be revealed to the Prophet was actually the lunchtime, Zohar, the lunchtime namaz, because it's the easiest. 
and the other at the two ends of the day in the middle of the afternoon these were released uh, revealed later on okay so here they are salat al-fajr dawn prayer salat al-zuhr noon prayer salat al-asr uh, middle of the uh, uh, afternoon salat al-maghrib uh, evening and salat al-isha at night five times that's in the quran because everything is in the quran <laughs> everything is in the quran because now look at the other two quotations on this slide surah 3191 so the quran talks about the sharia and of course it talks about the kiamat and it also talks about the tariqat and the marifat and the hakikat everything is in the quran but it needs authoritative interpretation not every tom dick and harry can uh, interpret the quran because they don't have that di divine light in them so look at surah 3191 such as remember allah standing sitting and reclining and consider the creation of the heavens and the earth so there are two words in here zikr and fikr and that, that means ibadat of uh, ilm as well as ibadat of uh, amal, action. So can you look at those words, standing, sitting, and reclining? A human being in 24 hours is always in those three positions. Either he's sitting or uh, she's sitting or standing or reclining. But the Quran says you must remember Allah all the time. And then Look at Surah 70, I 23. I have actually, um, sorry, let me go back to the first one, 3191. That when Pir Sadruddin wrote, Utte, Bethte, Raha Chalante, Nama Sahib Ji Ka Lijiye. You know, why did he say that in the Ginan? Because he is after the time of the Kiamat. Well, and I slam Shah's time. He went to India. And he used this Quranic ayat and he put it in the language of the people amongst whom he was doing that one. Put there, bet there. Standing, sitting. Only one phrase he has changed for the sake of poetry and walking on the way. Raha Chalante. Even when you're walking somewhere to go shopping, to go to work, to go wherever, recite the name of your creator. And then in the second one, I have deliberately put the Arabic translation, Allazinahum ala salatihim da'imun, who are constant at their worship, constant. No intervals, no interruptions. They are all the time linked to the light of the Imam. Da'imun, constant. Da'im and kain, we say in our languages, yes? And in Pir Pandyate Jahan Mardi, Malana Muslim Sirbillah, he says that a mu'min should be da'i imu zikr. Mu'min rabai ke da'i imu zikr bashad. A mu'min is always remembering Allah. That's what the Ismaili Tarika demands. It's very challenging. I, I have no doubt about that. But that's what is needed. So this is the uh, next uh, slide. We'll go to the next one, which is a very important one, just to show you. This is from Surah 2945. And I want to link the essence of this ayah to a hadith -e Qudsi, which I have not uh, done for you. Uh, this is something which has come to my mind now while I'm talking, that there is a hadith, a sacred tradition, a sacred tradition is where Allah speaks directly to the Prophet. And then if the Prophet wants to share it with the Ummah, he can. If he doesn't want to, he, he doesn't have to. It's different from the Wahi or the Revelation. And it is different from the Prophet's own sayings, like uh, I am the house of knowledge and Ali is the door. So in this Hadith and Awafil, God says that he he loves it when his uh, moments, his believers, they perform the supererogatory prayer, not only the obligatory, but additional, voluntary, which is what is the Zika. 
And he says, when they do that, when they do that additional prayer all the time, then I begin to love them. Allah begins to love us. And when he begins to love us, then he becomes the eye with which we see, the ear with which we hear. He becomes our hands with which we grasp. He becomes our feet with which we walk. Isn't that beautiful? This is Islamic literature, you know? And all of it is in favor of the Kiamati and the Ta'wili uh, interpretation. So this is why I've given you this Quranic reference, Surah 29, Ayat 45. And it says, establish the Salat, i.e. Uh, establish the Ramaz. Yeah? Indeed, why? Indeed, the Salat prevents from indecency and inequity. And verily, Allah's remembrance is greater. Wallazikrullahi akbar. Now, look at this ayat. You see, the Salat has its place. Definitely, it had its place in the time of Sharia because it prevented people from indecency and inequity. But verily, truly, really, Allah's remembrance is greater, greater. Think about this ayat, okay? You will have it on the um, when things are shared with you. Go and check it out in the Quran. The translation may not be absolutely the same uh, because many translations are uh, wanting. Yeah, they have uh, there are shortcomings in the translation, so you can compare two, three, four of them. But this is the meaning that salat has a place, definitely. But remembrance of Allah, zikr. And if you know these type of things, then you understand why the Imam makes so many farmans about whenever you have a minute, whenever you have a second, this, this, this. And I have already recited a farman, I think, about that view one. But I think in every farman, the Imam has been saying this for all the time. And not just as the Imam. Molana Muslim Sarbillah and uh, all the imams before that and um, uh, and uh, our peers because peers get their knowledge directly from the imam it's a consistent message for us okay let's go on to the next we now talk about zakat and this is also i hope that you are not tired all of you you need to listen very carefully to this one as well yeah. Zakah, I've given you the Quranic references. Wa akimu salata wa atu zakata wa arka'u ma arrakim. And establish worship prayer and pay the religious due. Now, I do want you to go and compare this with all the translations you will have, and you will see, you will never see the word religious due. You will say alms, poor due, charity, and I don't know what more. But that is not the meaning of zakah. That is not the meaning of zakah. I'm going to show you in a minute. So be careful when you use uh, translations of the Quran. Yes, I would rather we use the word zakah or sadaqah. So this is Surah 243, and note how. Salat and zakat go together. That's why these two pillars, third and the fourth, today are together. Salat and zakat. They have to be hand in hand. You can't pray and not give zakat. Or if you give zakat and you don't pray, that doesn't work either. This is all a system and you have to follow the system. And if it is a shariati system you are following, then follow that. If you are following the kiamati system, then you have to follow that. So let's go to the next one. This is Surah 9, Toba, and Ayat 103. And it is Kuzmin Amwalihim Sadakatan, Sadakatan, to Tahiruhum wa to Zakihim Biha wa Swali Alehim. Inna Salataka Sakanalul Lahum. 
why have I uh, highlighted those two words to 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 him? Because I want to show you the word to zaki him. You see to zaki him. Can you see the word zaka in it? Z A K H. Same letters as the word zaka. So now we shall look at the translation. Now, what does the translation say? Take sadaka of their wealth. This is a direct command to the prophet. Take sadaka of their wealth, wherewith you may purify them, to tatiruhum, purify them. And what does tuzaki him mean? And make them grow. and also pray for them so in in what sali alayhim pray for them why indeed your prayer is peace for them you know this word in nasalataka sakana lahum this sakana uh, i it's my favorite word because it's my mother's name sakina peace your prayer, the prophet's prayer, the imam's prayer is peace, real peace for them. And Allah is here, no. So now, if to zakihim means to make them grow, meaning they have baraka physically, spiritually, and intellectually. So they are going to grow in a material sense, they are going to grow in a spiritual sense, and they are going to grow in the sense of knowledge and intellect. And the prophet prays for you. And the imam prays for you. Now, if the prophet is not here anymore, according to many, who is taking this sadaqah? And who is purifying them and making them grow? And who is praying for them and giving them inner peace? You see, if you carefully understand the pillars of Islam, the pillars themselves will tell you that none of these things are possible without the presence of the Prophet or his direct progeny through Molana Ali and Bibi Fatima. So please remember this word to zakihim, and it is linked to the word zaka, the pillar, and its importance. Okay, let's go on to the next now. This is my final because uh, we are coming to the end of our time. Okay, so this is these are my concluding points here. Okay, the Holy Prophet Muhammad in his time, which was the time of Shariat or Tanzil. He taught his followers how to establish the salah. Because the Quran only says establish the salah. It doesn't tell how many uh, sajdas or how many ruku or how many Allahu Akbar or whatever should be done. It just says establish. It is the Prophet who taught the actual um, uh, process of doing the uh, salah. And it was he who told them what to pay as zakah. You know, in Sharia, you have to pay different, different types of zakah on gold, silver, on camels, on cows, on wheat, on barley, different, different types. This was all taught by the Prophet. It's not in the Quran. The Quran only says establish uh, prayer and uh, take zakah. So my question is that if you understood what I have been going on about, that if the Prophet was doing that in his time, who should it who should do it now in the time of Kiyamat or Ta'il? And I think the answer will be it has to be the Itrat, the progeny of the Holy Prophet, who should keep on doing this work according to the time and the space. So if the answer is the Prophet's Itra or progeny, who is the Imam of the time, this proves that to truly follow the pillars of Islam. We need to accept the principle of imamat and follow the first pillar of Islam, which is walaya. See, logic. 
step by step. Okay? And then I've given just one little tawil. You know that in the shariat in namaz, salat, it is led by what is called a pesh imam. I have uh, spelled that with a small i to distinguish from the, the uh, true imam <laughs> who is with a capital I. So a pesh imam leads a prayer. And how does he lead it? He stands in front of the congregation on his own. And the congregation is behind him, line by line, shoulder to shoulder. What is it? What is the ta'wil of that? You read any Ismaili Dari's books, and they will tell you the ta'wil of this is that the imam has to be a male from the direct line of the holy prophet. Whereas when women recite the salah or namaz, and the woman is going to lead, she will not stand in front of the other women. She will stand in the same line as the women. So it's Tawil is the Imam of Blind. He also receives our zakah and prays for us. And then he uses the zakah for the benefit of humankind. Because we believe that all human beings are from the single soul. That's a teaching of the Quran that the Imam interprets for us. And then there is purification, growth, baraka, and peace in his prayer for his mercy. And the final point is that Islam is a dynamic faith. In many interviews, many speeches of Hazrat Imam, you will hear that Islam is for all times and all places. You know, if somebody says that um, uh, the Prophet, uh, uh, the Prophet uh, taught us a Sharia, therefore now we have to keep on that uh, Sharia for the rest of uh, history until this world comes to an end, or if it doesn't. <laughs> uh, what, what are they saying? They are going totally against nature. They are going totally against nature. For instance, let me ask you that the Prophet, the Holy Prophet himself in his time was Wakulla Shayna Sayna Ufi Imam Mubin. He could see the future, he could see the past, he could see the physical world, he could see the spiritual world. The Prophet didn't know that his uh, followers would one day end up living within the Arctic Circle. And that in the Arctic Circle, if the Ramzan uh, happens to fall in the months of July and August, then the sun never goes down. The sun never goes down. So then they cannot break the fast for three months. The Prophet didn't know that. Of course he knew that. That he knew that the world would change. That's why he appointed his progeny as the Imams to interpret the faith and to guide the people according to the time. And it is a right and the prerogative of his progeny, the Imams, that they should change the forms because the essence always remains. I showed you that slide yesterday. And in fact, I've given a subheading, the pillars of Islam, form and essence. The form has to change. Dar es Salaam Farman, 1988, in my first presentation yesterday. Okay. And so the concluding point today is Islam is a dynamic faith, which is for every time and every place. And it can be practiced universally if you go to the moon. You know, human beings are preparing to go and live on the moon. So if you are living on the moon, it is the month of Ramadan, you will not be able to see the moon in the sky because it's on underneath your feet. And if it is the end of the month of Ramadan, you can't see the moon, you are not going to break your, finish your Ramadan. <laughs> Islam is for all places and all times. And it can be practiced universally. Why? Because of the presence of the Ulul Amra, which we discussed yesterday only. I hope that, you know, that is fresh in your minds. I hope you have had time to reflect on it. I hope that you are going to digest this knowledge and to think about it logically. Because I've given you enough references.
from the Quran, from the Hadith, from the Ginans, from the Imam's writings, from the peace composition. Plenty of references. All of this is primary sources. None of it is secondary, third hand or fourth hand. And I pray that you should all have the, the energy and the time to reflect on what you are hearing. And to ask yourself, does it please your intellect? Does it please your logic? Or is it contradicting your logic? Thank you very much, all of you, for listening. And thank you for your interest. Subhanallah, 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 Rashida Saiba. Nachis can just pray that Ali Allah broaden our hearts and minds so we may absorb what Tavili pearls you have um, given us today and you've been giving us for so long. Um, I mean, with that, uh, the first question we have, um, I would request humbly that you, re you repeat the prayer you start with today that may Mola give us Rani Taid. Um, the question came from that dua that please elaborate on what sessions do we attend, what we don't attend, how to distinguish and how much. So if you can repeat that prayer and then, you know, elaborate a little bit more about it. Okay. Okay. So I always begin by asking uh, Imam because he's the fountainhead, he's the source of light. And uh, this light is not abstract, you know, it's not like the light of the sun, which you can see coming on my face from my window. The Imam's light is actually in the form of Hakikati knowledge, primary source knowledge. It is Hakikati knowledge that itself is new. And so when I start with that prayer is that uh, Ya Mola, uh, bless the listeners and the speakers with your luminous spiritual help. Taid, it's called Taid, right? Spiritual, luminous, Nurani help. Why? So that the speaker does not slip up and the listeners are not distracted and they can understand the speaker's logic and they can understand what they are trying to convey. Okay? Now, on the matter of which sessions you should attend and which you shouldn't attend, that is a, you know, something we are human beings because God has given us the gift of the intellect. So we have to use our intellect and we have to decide that what you are, what you are hearing, like I said at the end of this uh, session, what you are hearing, does that appeal to your intellect? your logic or is it contrary you have to decide yourself okay you have to judge where the speakers are coming from how many primary sources are they using yes this is up to you it's like uh, which book should i read you know should i read a book uh, written by an ismaili uh, hujjat peer dai imam like nasiruddin tusi you know, he had read many books, but when he read this book of Maulana Allah Zikri his salam's uh, lectures or sermons, his entire uh, being changed and he became an Israeli. So we have to make that judgment, which is why to be Daimu Zikri is very important. So if you are remembering Maulana's light all the time, chances are you will make the right choices. Like I said yesterday, those people who do not, who forget to remember Mola and they ignore him and they get too busy in their world. What happens? They have Vaswasa, they have the insinuations of Shaitan. And the Shaitan will tell you, no, no, read this book. And that book will be very detrimental to you. Yeah? So the point about being Daimo Zika is that it is the best protection a mommy can have. It's a best shield. It's a shield. And knowledge is a shield. It protects you. 
I hope that answers you. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Uh, next question we have is, in view of your Kiyama explanation, would it be correct to say that we have taken Shariat to a higher level with the guidance of our Imam and our interpretation of Islam? Yes, that's what I have been saying all along. If you remember, during the Jamakana uh, sessions, I had shown a picture of a bud, a flower, a raw fruit, and a ripe fruit. Right? So this is the example from nature of how things are dynamic. So how can religion be dead? Religion also has to be dynamic. But what have we shown was that when the bud opens up into a flower, Yes, the bud has lost its form, but its essence is now at a higher level. It's a flower. And then when the beautiful flowers, you know, the petals fall to the ground because their time is finished, what appears? A raw fruit appears, which is a higher level. Because now the chances are we can have ripe fruit. And when the raw fruit changes its uh, form, what happens to its essence? It becomes sweet. It has a kernel inside. And inside the kernel, there is a seed. And with that seed, you can grow another tree. But if you try to grow a tree with the raw fruit or with the flower or the bud, you will not be able to grow another tree. The perfection is when the fruit ripens and contains that kernel. So yes, every stage is higher than the previous and the form changes, but the essence is carried and it is at a higher level of teaching. Hmm? SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Another question is, um, Rashida Saba, oftentimes Sunni Muslims put forth the idea that there should be no change in religion, sometimes based on Quranic verses about Deen Fitra, Surah uh, 30, Ayah 30, <clears throat> and the verse about no change in Allah's Sunnah, Surah 35, Ayah 43. Can you speak a little bit about these verses, particularly about Sunnah of Allah and Fitrat of Allah and no changes in them? How does one reply correctly that this does not mean the form of religious practices are set eternally? Yes, that's, you know, this is exactly the problem, isn't it, right? That uh, 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 the majority of Muslims, they did not accept uh, the light of Imamat. They gave up the light of Imamat, even though at gadir -e kum the Prophet had said so clearly that, you know, I'm leaving behind me two things. So the two things, I was talking about it yesterday, wasn't I? that those two things are also in the Quran, uh, light and a book. In Surah 5, Ayat 15, Kad ja'akum min lahi nurun wa kitabu mubin. Indeed, from Allah has come light first, and then the kitab mubin. So you can't read the book without the nur. And there would have been no book if there had not been nur first. So it, it is not necessary that we try and... Uh, talk to them about the ayat which they are asking. We should know a few ayats like this one, 515. And not only 515, 932 tells you that this nur cannot be blown out, no matter how much the disbelievers uh, detest it, hate it. So where is that nur? If Allah in two places says that this nur cannot be blown out, then you tell us where. We will leave our imam aside for the moment. You tell us where is this nur. And the Quran also says, The Quran also says that nobody knows it's Tawil except Allah and the Rasikun Right? So, you know, uh, you need to know the Quran really well to try and convince the people. But you can see how they have misinterpreted that ayah 3030, Deen e Fitra. Islam is the religion of nature. And the best example of nature, God himself says, is the man, a human being. Is a human being the same 
from a one on month old baby to a 90 year old man? No. We use that example as well, that if you, if, for instance, if you take a photograph every 10 years, Molana Sultan Shah Salvatullahi Alayhi gave this example. Take a picture of a human being at age 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, whatever they live up to, right? It is a photograph of the same person. Are they the same? <laughs> no. <laughs> when they were babies, they were chubby, yes, and they had beautiful skin. And when they are 70, 80, 90 years old, their faces are all wrinkled, their hair goes gray, uh, their teeth fall out, their eyes become uh, less strong, etc. Right? Who can say that if nature remains the same? If nature remains the same, then why is the world changing? Why are there seasons? <laughs> Why do human beings change? So they have misinterpreted the word sunnah, that there is no change in the sunnah of Allah. That means there is no change in the habit, the principles of Allah. And what are the principles of Allah? Only two, nur and book. Those are the principles of Allah. They don't change. <laughs> the rest changes. Yeah, so their argument is very weak. It is a misinterpretation. For instance, they think that the sunnah of Allah is different from the sunnah of the Prophet. We Ismailis don't think that. We say that's a one thing. Subhanallah, 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 beautifully said. Um, the next question is, Nachis will combine two questions together. Um, how to convey the sun principle to, to seven, eight-year-olds so they learn early in life? And another question with similar linings are, how do we help the uh, many young adults who have stopped paying the son and many have stopped believing? Is there hope for them? Um, will Mola guide them? Uh, people are asking these questions, I realize, because they really want to know and be able to help others, etc. But, uh, you know, I think we have to reflect a lot on some of these, yeah? And here you are, uh, you, I have to give spontaneous answers, okay? So let's take the first one, uh, a young child, seven, eight. Do you remember your own childhood? I remember my own childhood, yes? That uh, what happened? Eid, Eid comes along and uh, we celebrate uh, the uh, Eid, right? Uh, because Molana Mustan Sibila says in Pir Pandyate John Mardi, because we are fasting the whole year, therefore our Eid is every day. But also in keeping with the Islamic calendar, we have Eid al Fitr and Eid al Azhar. And on those days, you give children, well, in my time, they gave, my mother used to give us five shillings. Yeah, every child had five shillings. And then she would say, okay, Amati the son Kadwaniche, you have to take out the son. So that's how you bring up little children, right? Bring up your children by teaching them that concept that this is not your earning, I'm giving it to you, but you have to practice from now. And you also, parents make one big mistake. One of my students here in London tells me that uh, Rashida Bai, I wish I had kept my son with me when I am giving the dasan to the mukhi so that he can see it and he can see the dua that I get. I wish I had done that. Perhaps that is something you should do, is that when you are uh, submitting your dasan, keep your children with you. Okay? So there you see by example. Now for young people who are not doing it, for young you know, adults who are earning well, this, that, and the other. How do we explain to them? If they are ready to listen to the Quran, show it to them. You know, that ayat which I use, Surah 9, ayat 103. There is also one, uh, Surah 9, ayat 101, I think it is. Uh, let me just check. Um, in, it's also very important. You know, there are, there are 
there are not only the areas which we use in our uh, 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 I can't find it straight away. Uh, so, but the ayat says that uh, God, God, Allah, here it is not the Prophet's name, it's the name of God, that God has bought from the believers, bought, right? Like buy and sell. He has bought from the believers their lives and their property in order to give them Jannah, to give them heaven. You know, this is a very important ayat. Uh, if you give me one minute, I will try and find that. Oh my God, what is this? It's also in Surah 9. I can send it to you afterwards because we, we will waste time if I, uh, you know, my papers are not in place because we had another class before this one started. Sure. One minute, let me just get. I have made for myself an index, which is very important if you want to. Yeah, it's 9111, 9111. Allah has bought from the believers. The word is bought. You know, people think in religion, what is the necessity of money? Well, let me put you right today. Like in physical life, think of the sacrifices you have to make in order to get success. In religion, also, you have to make sacrifices. So things are not going to fall into your lap. And if there are young people who are so well educated now because they live here in the West, and if they can't understand that, then they should really examine themselves, right? And and they should have, you know, intellectual discussions with the members of the Jamaat who are better informed than them, okay? But I would like to give you an example from nature. Because this is my personal experience. There was a, an English worker at the Ismaili Center in London. He fell in love with an Ismaili girl from Canada and he married her. So she insisted you have to be an Ismaili. So because I, my office was there and my work was to teach uh, people who wanted to enter Ismailism, uh, I taught him, right? And he was ready to accept everything because, uh, you know, many times he had opened the door of Imam's car and the Imam had stepped out. But he could not understand the concept of zakat, of uh, the son, of sadaqa, of sacrifice, financial. He couldn't understand that. Very strange because, you know, even in Christianity, they have a tie. You tell me any religion which does not have the concept. I would be really interested if these young people give me an example of a religion that does not demand financial sacrifice. <laughs> so this Amir, he, he took the Ismaili name Amir. I came home and I spoke to my husband, Dr. Munzai, and I said, he's simply not ready to listen. So my husband said, but he works in the garden, doesn't he, of the roof garden, Ismaili center? I said, yeah. So Pakti Sahib said to me, Ask him why, when the spring comes, why does he prune, prune his bushes? Roses, this, that, and the other, they cut off the top of the bush. Why? Because that promotes greater growth. So there is an example in nature. When you cut a, a one stem rose at a certain point, two stems will grow. So in nature, pruning is to promote growth. And you saw from my slide of nine, one or three, that sadaka, the son, zakat, is in order to purify, to make them grow, and to give them peace through your prayer. So show them these things, and then if they are still not ready to accept, then it is their bad luck. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Um, 
I don't have more questions regarding today's topic. So, inshallah, we will send you the chat with um, Rosa questions and others which you can incorporate. Um, if any friends have any more questions, um, they can either put it in the chat so we can share it with Rashida Saiba. Um, thank you so much, Rashida Saiba. Uh, we will, inshallah, see you um, next Saturday morning. And um, you know, with prayers of Yali Madad and um, that's the Mola Ali Madad and you. Yali Madad. Yali Madad. All of you. Yali Madad. You all. May Mola be with you all. Yali Madad. 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 Yali Mad